Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love. I'm Kat Spada, and today we're doing things a little bit differently. I am joined by actress, writer, and podcaster Janie Haddad Tompkins. Half Lebanese, classically trained, and TV obsessed, Janie is a light comic actress raised in the American South. Determined to create and bring to life desirable and unique roles for women over 40 on screen while also digging deeper into the psyche of the human condition, Janie currently lives and pickets in LA with her comedian husband, Paul F. Tompkins, with whom she hosts the ongoing humorous conversation podcast, Stay F. Homekins. Her successful newsletter, Weekend Water, is available to subscribe to on Substack, link in the show notes. And her TV work includes Night Court, Regular Show, Comedy Bang Bang, and Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Welcome, Janie. Oh, hi. Thank you so much for having me, Kat. Well, you were like the first kind of new face I met on the picket lines this summer. I know. You're the most prolific picketer I've ever witnessed. (laughs) It's actually amazing because I live right next to Warner Brothers, and I think that's where you go a lot of the time. So we've crossed paths here and there. Yeah, yeah. Um, And and you're in the you're in the Writers Guild. Are you also in the Screen Actors? Or are you happy that the actors with us now or with y'all? I am not yet in the Writers Guild. I hope to be one day, and uh, I'm happy that the actors are out on the picket lines big time. Although it's it's incredible. It's a totally different dynamic. Like. At Warner Brothers, I love the way that you can tell the WGA captains are like, all right, come on, cross the street. And the SAG after captains are like, let's go, BMW, give me some honks. We yeah, they're like, this. let's do like a dance, a dance line across the crosswalk. I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But you've been out there like, I, mean, I want to really be in the showing. WGA as well. That's sort of, yeah. and, and uh, so I was out there like at the beginning as well. As a pre WGA candidate, I guess. Yes. <laughs> so I'm like interested in the in the industry not uh, folding and not being destroyed by the new structures and stuff. So yeah. 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 Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> <laughs> or is this the last season? Is this the last season of Hollywood? I don't know. There's always I, I there's always space for a reboot. We've seen it done before. <laughs> um. I think that what's been really cool, I mean, for me, like I remember picketing in 2007 as like someone who didn't have, had like never had a real job before and going out there and feeling like it was a very networking moment for me. I was like, I have business cards. I'm going to show it, show them to everybody. And now it's just like, everyone's out there just like, Hey, how you doing? You need some water? Are are you okay? Like it's a lot more human. It's a different, it's a different vibe for sure. I like it better. I like the vibe better now. Yeah. I felt like in 2007, when actors came, we weren't as embraced by the writers. Yeah. But now it's different. (laughs) Now they're like, oh my God, thank you so much for being here. And I'm like, (laughs) yeah, let's let's do this. Let's win this. (laughs) Yeah. So we have an unusual format, I think, for the show today because... We're not talking about movies and TV. We're not talking about the products of struck companies. Um, Although this podcast has been around for years, it has covered a variety of mediums and we're literate ladies who love to laugh. So the other day I posted online, I was looking for memoir recommendations. Janie, you came through with so many great recommendations. I I was like, this one, this one, this one. (laughs) Yes. And it was great. Like, they weren't ones I'd read before, which was awesome. Um, I also uh, heard you on Chelsea Devontes' podcast yes. um, about ce- uh, Celebrity Book Club, talking about Gina Davis's memoir, Dying of Politeness. Yep. I just want to share, I worked for the Gina Davis Institute for like five <gasps> seconds. Wait, what? Are you kidding? Oh my gosh. Can we do the entire podcast about that? Because I think the Gina <laughs> Davis Institute is such a rad concept. It's so rad. I only got to meet Gina one time. I I like to pride myself. I'm like, I know get starstruck. I'm from <laughs> LA. Sure. But when eight feet of Gina Davis starts, oh, right. like she's like a tall statuesque <laughs> beauty, right? Yeah. And we were at like a function too. So she was all full glam. And I just uh-huh. I, I must have been 
so sweaty. Like I felt like just so intimidated and she was lovely and wonderful, of course. I'm um, so glad to hear that because she sounded yeah. that way from her, from her, like uh, her memoir and when I've seen her yeah. interviewed and stuff. Yeah, it's um, actually maybe maybe that's what we'll, we'll talk about in the Patreon because I definitely have some more like Gina Davis Institute anecdotes to share. So maybe we can do that at the end of the show. Okay, sounds um, good. Yeah, but I'm curious. So something that like everyone has a very different reader style. Uh huh. Um, and like, what's yours? You read a lot. Well, that's very flattering and generous of you to say. I don't really think, I think I just appear to read a lot. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> um, I, I don't feel like I read as much as I like, as I would like to because of the internet existing. Cause I'm always reading totally. like websites and stuff. But, um, I, well, I'm, do you remember when Amazon introduced the Kindle, the e-reader, like the first e-reader? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I was like, when this thing got announced, I was like, oh my God, this is my jam. Like, this thing is yeah. a brilliant idea. And it was, I want to say it was like 2006 or seven. I, mean, I think it was like 2007 that it came out. And I was like, I'm going to get one of those. And I was gifted yeah. one for Christmas. My, my boyfriend at the time, who's not my husband, gifted me one for Christmas. And I was like, I am an e-reader enthusiast. Like I <laughs> I just thought it was such an amazing idea to be able to carry around like a hundred books in one like, yeah. like feather weight, uh, like tiny little thing and always be right, not able to like iPod. download a book. Yeah. It was like such a great idea. Yeah. And so I still am sort of um, an e-reader only person. I love that I can uh, also borrow books in addition to purchase books um, from the library. I'm an e-reader, and I tend to read like mainly at night in in the solace of like a quiet room, like bedroom. Um, I used to like read more when I lived in New York. Briefly, I would read on the subway and stuff like that. Um, but now I just feel like our lives are such like our attention is is so demanded by yeah. other things um i kind of have to like make like carve out that space but that's yeah. that's me i'm not one of those people that's like i just how can you like i just like <laughs> the pages i like the way it smells and and all this stuff and it's like yeah well also i have like when i read different books they're all the same size font. I get to dictate the exact size and style right. of font that I get to read. And so there's um, a continuity and a consistency to my reading experience. Is that what you're after? I wasn't sure yeah. what you meant. Okay. That is what I was curious about because I feel like I grew up as like I always had a book in hand, you know, mm -hmm. maybe because I'm the... I'm the baby of the family, so my siblings were way older and they were doing other stuff. So I always had a book to read while, like, my sister was at her softball game or something. And where did you grow up? I grew up in Glendale, California. Oh wow! Okay, you're yeah. lo a local, <laughs> local babe, real local, uh, valley adjacent. I like to say, yeah. Um, and then now I cannot read a book to save my life. Like I can't sit down to a book and finish it. So yeah. I listen to audiobooks. Oh, you're an audio. A, a lot of people have said like, oh, it's such a great way. Because I do like to listen to podcasts and um, conversation podcasts when I walk and stuff like that or exercise. And yeah. they're like, oh, well, I'm an audiobook person. And I just haven't caught, gotten there yet. Um, I haven't gotten it there. kind of, you know, I think it started with like my first job. I had like an hour long commute. So I'd go get audiobooks on CDs from the library and I'd put them in my CD changer in my car. Yes. And get through a book or two a week. And then that became a habit. So now I have the Libby app and I will get audiobooks from the library and yeah. listen to them while I go on my walks. Such and a great concept. Of, I love that the option exists. Yeah. And it's very like I have a friend, Santina Muha. I don't know if you know her. Oh yeah, I know um, Santina. Yeah. She, I think she said like, likes to do nonfiction audiobooks and then fiction as like regular books. And I think that's such an interesting preference. Yeah. 
I totally get it though. Like I, if I'm going to like walk and focus on something, it's something, or if I'm going to knit while I listen to an audiobook, it has to be something very engaging. But if I'm going to listen to like a comedian's memoir, which I'll talk about a couple of those today, I can do that while I'm washing the dishes or like yeah. kind of a little lighter. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. Um, and so we just like threw a bunch of memoirs on our list to talk about. And I tried to break them into categories for the sake of uh, organizing a podcast episode. But I will acknowledge that so many of these, I was like, I mean, yeah, that's coming of age and it's an adventure and there's grief and she's yes. a celebrity to me. Like they sure. all kind of overlap. I love storytelling. Like I like to go to storytelling shows and listen to The Moth or whatever. So I feel like a memoir is just an extended version of that. Yeah, I love memoir writing. I, I like how sort of intimate and, and personal it is. And um, I, and I like to dig deep. And when I like sometimes back in the day when we would meet people more organically, yeah. um, I don't know, COVID like has changed habits of that or whatever. I always thought it was interesting uh, to just learn people's origin stories and stuff. So for me, yeah. it's like it's like kind of that a little bit. Oh, yeah. You know what? I didn't put here on our categories, but when you said origin story, it made me think of comic books. Mm. And there's a lot of graphic memoir out there as well. Oh, and interesting. I don't really venture into the graphic genre, but I know it's like super popular, but I'm just not as, as visual, I guess, as I am more internal. Um, yeah. I remember... So I didn't know how to read comic books. Like my sister was really into comics and I was trying, okay. I went to Comic-Con and they were talking about the Watchmen movie that was coming out in like 2007 or something. Okay. And I was like, I really want to read that comic before the movie comes out. It's supposed to be like the greatest comic ever written. So I bought it and I started reading it and I could not follow the story. I was like, I have no idea what's happening. I don't know where my eyes are supposed to look on the page. Oh, wow. <laughs> I had to like learn how to read comics. I had to like get ones where I already knew the story. And then because I was just reading the word bubbles, like I wouldn't actually look at the pictures. Yeah, I don't know if I, I've, I've had that um, primer yet. So maybe if I, yeah. if I were like taught how to do it, maybe I would get more into into that genre as well. Yeah, I think you would like it because it's so cinematic. Like once I realized it's like, oh, it's like you're reading a screenplay except that the images are here drawn for you instead of being like description. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's like Fun Home by Alison Bechdel and Persepoli by Marjan Satrapi um, are probably two of the first like graphic memoirs I ever read. And... Uh, obviously they are both like, they both turned into movies. So you could like watch the movie first and then read the comic and you're like, oh, now I know what happens. Okay, anyway. cool. Yeah. That sounds really cool. Yeah. Um, but like, I figured let's just start with coming of age. Although I feel like coming of age stories can happen when you're like 60, you know, it's just a, a time of self discovery, I think is the what coming of age really means. Yeah, I guess for me, like coming of age is sort of like the end of your innocence in a way. Mm, like if you have yeah. sort of like a naivete about like there's definite like moment in time when you're sort of passing from like navigating the world as a young person into navigating the world as like, oh, a full adult. I'm like a full adult now. Yeah. Like I have a different... yeah worldview or point of view from whatever this inciting incident was. Totally, totally. So you had mentioned a book called Acceptance, but I don't know anything about it. Well, you, I, I just kind of accidentally read that one kind of recently. And you had mentioned the book Educated, which is an mm -hmm. amazing memoir about uh, kind of like leaving a religious cult and yeah. You know, and this acceptance is sort of similar in vain to mm -hmm. to that uh, that style of like having to kind of like emancipate yourself from some kind of oppressive upbringing. Right. I don't know. I just I kind of stumbled upon it and I couldn't put it down. I thought it was a fascinating story. This 
young person like went through like an incredibly challenging and traumatic sort of upbringing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I liked that one quite a bit. With educated, I remember thinking, oh, I get, I know what I'm about to get into, like cult stuff. And then oh, she's going to end up being super smart and going to Oxford. And it's not, it's so different than what I anticipated. It's so harrowing. And like, I think the way that she talks about being in this, like, just being in peril, constantly oh my in God. peril. Yes. I mean, th- that book, I was like, she's lucky that she's alive. Yeah. From all the abuse that sort of took place in her, her home. The way that she tells the story too, like, I don't think she says the word abuse until maybe like very late in the book or it didn't like click for me. She's just telling like, oh, yeah, this is what growing up was like. And this was me learning how to like ride a tractor when I was five years old or whatever. Unsupervised. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, or whatever. This horrible (laughs) accident happened and we never got medical treatment for it. And she's just telling you like this is the only thing I knew. Yes. I think that's such an interesting trajectory in Educated too about – people who have experienced abuse in childhood i think that mm-hmm. is a common relatable whatever the whatever the situation is like a common relatable thing where you don't really it 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 takes there's like a process to even naming it as abuse yeah totally because how would you know like if all you've ever been told is this is how families are exactly And you don't see, like, they were so isolated. You don't see other things. That's, like, that's something I also really love about, like, memoir or anything where, like, I'm lucky my parents never got divorced, right? But there have been some stories I've read or movies and shows I've seen where I'm, like, this really takes me into the heart of, like, a child who's watching their parents go through a divorce. Sure. And, like... You don't have to have experienced it to feel the, like, emotional truth of it. Um, And obviously, like, educated is so, like, my parents wrapped me in bubble wrap. Like, I had the opposite experience, but. um, I'm sure we all have had our uh, adversity, our childhood adversity, (laughs) whatever they are. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Um, Did you read Sarah Polly's book? Yes. uh, Run Toward the Danger. Is that what it's called? Run Toward the Danger about her traumatic brain injury? Yeah. And, well, the traumatic brain injury, but, like, I threw it in with coming of age, even though the injury happened as an adult. And, like, she also talks about, like, sexual assault and things that did occur when she was uh, older and, like, a professional, well-known person. But I thought about it with educated in terms of when she talks about being on, um, on the set of, oops, I didn't, I, it completely jumped out of my mind. Um, Terry Gilliam's movie that she was in when she oh, was a child. Oh, yes. That was such a harrowing experience where yeah. she was like a child actor in Europe and there was hardly any like safety oversight and they were like demanding things of her and she kind of like carried it as real scarring trauma for a long time. Uh, Baron von Munchausen, I think that was the movie. That's like, what it was. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I mean, her parents were looking out for her. Like, her parents weren't abandoning her or anything. But the way in which, like, the Swiss, all the holes of Swiss cheese lined up to where, like, there were enough people on set who weren't going to protect this child or the crew. There were enough people in her family who were like, but you're on a big Hollywood movie, so this is what's supposed to happen. That, That book actually inspired me to watch her documentary about her origin story yeah um did you watch that i can't recall the title stories we tell yeah something like that it was so good i i recommend it i don't want to spoil it because there's a bit of like a surprise element um which i think she talks about in the book so it was kind of spoiled for me but yeah (laughs) yeah yeah she i mean she's just such like a i feel like it's she's also somebody that's uh interesting when you think about like she I do think purposely stepped away from her acting career. Yeah. Like she could have continued to have more roles in her 20s and 30s. But I think these experiences that she talks about are like why she became somebody more behind the camera. Yeah. I mean, but also, I mean, she she has proven herself to be such a talent as a director. It's like 
Well, if you can do that that well, why not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I could do that, I guess I would say I would stuff away too. <laughs> I know, right? I know, like Gina Davis like lands at the Olympics with her Yeah. Archery. It's like, oh, okay. I guess I guess we all have some hidden talent that we've yet to discover. Um, I don't know how we're supposed to find out what that is, but hopefully it will reveal itself to me before my deathbed. Okay. <laughs> Well, yeah, but I thought about- the traumatic brain injury part of her book was yes, so fascinating yes. too because she was like people like with TBI to me it's like so I I, I don't know about you it's like one of my biggest fears is like a TBI mm. like I have it's like part of my little anxiety my fun little generalized anxiety disorder is like thinking about a uh, brain injury but um that, I can't relate at all, by the way. <laughs> I, I've never been anxious. <laughs> really? I mean, we only live like in a culture and society and era where anxiety is probably like inescapable. Like unless yeah. maybe I have to, <laughs> I, I don't know. But, but um, yeah, so it, it, she had sort of, which I thought was so helpful to people. She had sort of been like guided to kind of rest herself and like mm-hmm. avoid taxing um, exercises. And then she went to this like renowned institute. I want to say it was like in Pittsburgh or something where the, the preeminent healer of like TBI was like, Oh no, 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 no. You like tax yourself to death, like every day, like start like re right. like, like rebuilding this muscle of like, you know, over, overworking, over taxing, reading more doing, you know, and that fatigue is like, that's the muscle that you're rebuilding and rewiring the neuroplasticity mm-hmm. stuff in your brain. And I was like, oh, this is going to be so helpful to people because it seemed like that was not some ad- like adopted practice for healing yeah. brain injury that, that like she stumbled upon it kind of. Totally. And like, like I've, this year I'm, I've done physical therapy for the first time and it's completely the same where I always thought, oh, like my, like my hip is bothering me. I'm just going to rest. Yeah. And it's like, no, do squats yeah. like, you need to <laughs> rebuild like, that strength. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just like, oh, but, but rest. <laughs> uh, but that's what I would say. Are you sure I don't need to rest? <laughs> They're like, yeah, I'm you tired. rest in ice after you've done the after squats. You've done the like, thing. <laughs> yeah. That's one reason why you're seeing me out there on the picket line is I'm supposed to be walking, walking more. more. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> moving on. You were uh, moving on. And I. No, no. I mean, that that's a perfect uh, segue to pr- probably our most robust category and for no you know no mystery why is is the celebrity memoir there's podcasts about it but also yeah. like i think they're really great because people who don't necessarily think oh i'm going to go pick up a book it's oh like, yeah. yeah but we're all interested in these stories oh they're about- juicy i mean es- yeah. especially if they're juicy like you want yeah. sometimes you want the juice you're like, I yeah. just want to know. Like, I'm so like, oh, I'm like jealous of their life of glamour and fame and everything. And then you're like, oh, wait, no, they're just like regular people with all kinds of like horrible things that happen to them like everybody else. <laughs> yeah. There's something yeah. comforting about that. And I don't mean that <laughs> to be like in a mean way. I'm just saying like in a more empathic way. <laughs> well, like, I'll start with Molly Shannon's book. Okay. Hello, Molly. I've heard it's amazing. This is one that is on my list. And I have met Molly Shannon, and I think she's a, an amazing comedic and dramatic actor and yeah. a very kind and warm and accessible human being. So, and she had sort of a traumatic childhood. Right. I mean, that's the thing that was so incredible about her book. And it, and especially with celebrity, when you do audiobooks like I do, they read it and you get to hear them tell you their story. And it's like, you know, she's the era of SNL. You know, they say your favorite era of SNL is the one that was that you first started watching. So like when I first started staying up late to watch SNL was when she was on it. Yeah. And she's so funny and peppy and big and bright. And her mom and siblings died in a horrible accident when she was very young. Yeah. (laughs) And her father did not know how to raise her after that. And he kind of, he did the like TBI thing, except that's 
that's how you handle an injury, not a child. Right, right. And he also was like, you well, I'm sure he was grieving. You raised yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine. Totally. Uh, not to excuse neglecting your, <laughs> your child. But, <laughs> but yeah, he was uh, going through it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that if, if, they always say like comedy comes from tragedy. And if there is mm-hmm. an example of such, I mean, that has got to be like a quintessential textbook example. Um, my favorite moment in her book is in the acknowledgements at the very end. I was knocked on my butt listening to this. And I later went into a bookstore and opened it up because I wanted to see, did this only exist in the audio version? And she wrote it as well. She's thanking her her kids and her agent and her friends and everybody. And then she thanks her husband, Fritz. And she says, you taught me how to laugh again. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. This is why, like, I've just <laughs> cried and laughed. And then you just ended it with this little sweetheart punch. It's just yeah. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait to read that one. I'm very excited. <laughs> so you had some some great ones that were written by, like, like, legendary women like Sally Field and <sighs> Jennifer Lewis and Cicely Tyson. Okay. The Sally Field one is brutally sad. Mm. Brutally sad. But it is such an amazing read. And uh, she's an inspirational um, and and an actor that I really, I mean, she just, I didn't, she just kind of recently win like a lifetime achievement, like as an actor yeah. or something. Yeah. And so, um, that was, um, I had no idea about sort of her background and, uh, what she went through. Um, and then Jennifer Lewis one is kind of also a bit of a ride in terms mm. of like adversity, but she has such an outrageous personality that comes through in the book and yeah. that it's almost like she, you, you wouldn't even have to listen to the audio book to feel like you're reading kind of the audio book of it because you can, yeah, her voice, her voice is so her. And so yeah. you're just kind of like, wow. Like she also had a lot of like, she's like an admitted like sex addict and all this, like mm-hmm. just crazy wild stuff. And, uh, that one's called um, the Sally Field one. I think is called In Pieces, and Jennifer Lewis is the mother of Black Hollywood because she's always the, playing the mother, the mother yes. roles in like uh, in Black Hollywood. And then Cicely Tyson's memoir is also another legendary, another legendary actress that had an extraordinary life. Um, and what was interesting about hers is I remember her promoting the book and because it had, it had just come out. And then I think she died like a week after That's right. it came out. And it That's was right. almost like, it felt like, this is what I had to say. This is my life. It was this crazy, you know, journey as an artist um, with all these like loves and ups and downs or whatever. And then she just died like she, but she was in her nineties. I I mean, she, she lived an extraordinary long life. And so it almost felt like that was like the final word on her. Like she was like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to finish without like saying my, my piece, you know? Totally. So those are all very enjoyable. I think it's interesting. The, I mean, people can write memoirs at any age, like a heartbreaking work of staggering genius. I feel like Dave Eggers was like 24 or something when that came out. Um, <laughs> but right. he'd been through a lot. Um, but then it's like, when you said about like, what what's juicy is like to, to have Cicely Tyson at the end of her life, looking back yeah. is a completely different experience than your Andre Agassi's, your uh, Prince Harry's. But that's where it's like, well, we're in it. We're in the midst of the drama right now. So yeah. tell me everything. It's funny you mentioned those two specifically. They are both like ghost written by the same writer. And yeah. those are, um, Andre Agassi's uh, book Open is actually one of my favorite memoirs I've ever read. Re- I have to read it. It is such an amazing book about <sighs> like, it goes so internal with like the thesis of the book is that he is this tennis great who mm-hmm. despises tennis. Mm. 
And so you're kind of, and in a way, like Spare, the the same the book about Prince Harry that's written by the same ghostwriter has sort of a same sort of um, construct that he Mm -hmm. has this. um, Did you read that one? Did you read Spare? I didn't. I mean, when that came out, there were all these like like vulture articles and everything that were like the ten juiciest stories from Spare. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's about as far as I got. But yeah, I mean, I I've definitely was following the story of him, like, quote unquote, leaving the royal family. I will say that and there was a similar construct in that book. I, I loved Open so much and I thought Spare was quite good, but it's not in my like top 10. But um, but a similar construct of like, this is someone who was born into the into these extraordinary circumstances against his choice. Like he was simply. Yeah. By the ha- by the circumstance of his birth was born mm-hmm. into this life life that he did not consent to and he despises it <laughs> i mean essentially <laughs> like he despises yeah. it and feels constrained by it and it's so easy and dismissive to just be like oh poor. like in a way i feel like the andre agassi thing one is sort of like well he was born with this talent Mm -hmm. that you know and so you're like he kind of like chose to kind of go the distance with that talent whereas i guess the prince harry thing is he was just born into the station which is a little bit different but it is kind of worse in a way because he literally cannot leave that station whereas if you have a talent like you're kind of like well i'm driven by this talent this talent is pushing me this to this life that I'm not sure I'm consenting to or not. Whereas, yeah, I don't know. It was just an interesting, I just found like those, like t- the tension, the tension yeah. of those things were so fascinating. And like, you can't put it down almost like when you're reading about that. And, and there's, I mean, we could unpack this element of it, but the way that we ha- as like the public have, ownership over the people that are our figures that we look to like whether yeah. it's you know actors or athletes that you're like but I've been watching them ever since they were 16 and like now they're playing for my team yes. or whatever like with prince harry I'm not a subject of the king of england right but I remember <laughs> a little boy walking behind his mother's yes uh you know funeral pre- procession is like a formative moment of course we all had like everyone has opinions and that that is something that i think is also a big tension is how uh there was a documentary that came out a couple years ago about princess diana and it was all like kind of found footage documentary yeah it was on i don't know if you're if it yeah didn't have any talking heads or any narration it just i I probably watched it because that sounds like something i would definitely watch so i've watched like like several princess diana things so i I think i do remember that and it was like it was sort of like her in her own voice kind of a thing it was presented like Mm -hmm. that yeah 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 but it also i felt like by the end of it it kind of put the camera on on us a little. Oh, for sure. Like, like, what is our, like, we're the complicit ones. We're the ones that are, are really, you know, the, the voyeurs or whatever. And there's a human being on the other end of it. Right. If we weren't buying the magazines, if we weren't like paying attention to every, you know, fashion, fashion win and fashion fail, then like, would Britney Spears be in the situation she's in right now? Would, you know, and that's, I think, something that it, you just, especially with like a figure like Prince Harry and how he could not consent to this kind of life that he was born into. Yeah. And um, I feel like whatever rage, the if it's true or not true, although he writes about it in his book, like his brother being like pretty <laughs> angry at him or whatever. Yeah. It's yeah. like, I feel like the jealousy is that like he's stepping out. But he yes. has, you know, he's like cutting the chains. Yeah. And and, and the stakes are lower for you yeah. than they are for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, like the other brother, like he doesn't have a, like, because the one, th- wasn't the one, the brother of, of the, um, 
I can't. I don't know all the oh, the one that oh, abdicated like, of his grand yes. uh, the yes Elizabeth's Queen, Queen Elizabeth's uncle abdicated, uncle, yeah. and it was such a scandal. Like, who would think that they could just like abdicate like that? <laughs> you couldn't. Um, this is so. God, I am. Re- this is the most reductive thing I'm ever going to say, but. I have joked about this publicly before. Um, the first time I ever quit a job, yeah, I didn't do it. I, I didn't think it was possible. And then the Pope quit. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, who cares if I stay in my assistant job? <laughs> like the Pope can just stop being Pope. <laughs> like, but that like that like inspired that just you. shocked me. Inspired. It shocked me. <laughs> you were inspired, inspired by the Pope quitting. I I, I love that. <laughs> he was just like, you know, enough poping for me. Like <laughs> I'm ready to be retired. I mean, we are we talk a big game in this current moment in our history or whatever about like consent, like consenting to things and mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> there are still th- things out there that like you can say no to, but like do you want to pay the price? Yeah. Yeah. I I'm gonna lighten it up with a couple of yeah. my celebrity picks. Okay, let's which, go lighten it. I mean, th- like these are two maybe recent reads, so that maybe there's some recency bias. But when I thought about just how much I loved them, they're Bob Odenkirk and Mel Brooks. I read and Bob's, but not Mel's. Again, another audiobook win for me is like hearing old man Mel Brooks tell you these stories and like Does he have the good voices stories on. in 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 there? Should I read that one? Does Definitely. he have like some good like showbiz, some ch- showbiz chestnuts that I He does. You know, it's almost like there's there is definitely a piece like he doesn't talk too much about the loss of his wife, right? And I thought that might be a bigger part of the book, but that's not the story. It's clearly not the story he's there to tell. Okay. Like, he's not there to talk about, like, the great love or being a yeah. war. Yeah. The great love. Um, he's there to tell you about working with Sid Caesar. And okay. uh, w- one of my favorite, like, anecdotes was that um, in Sweden, they released the producers under the title Springtime for Hitler. Uh, they just made a decision that like translating it would make would sell better tickets at the box office. Whereas in the US, every producer and distributor had been like, you cannot call this, you cannot put Hitler in the title right. of this movie. It cannot be on the marquees. It has to be something else. So they called it the producers. But it was so successful in Sweden that they ended up calling every Mel Brooks movie after that came out with the title Springtime for the Sheriff or (laughs) Springtime for Frankenstein. (laughs) So it was like he created a springtime springtime franchise somehow. Yeah. Yeah. And you can tell he's just like, oh, that still makes me laugh after all these years. (laughs) Like that's kind of the tone of his voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Bob Odenkirk's, I mean, I just, I felt like that was one where like you read it and realize like this man has been working hard for so long yeah and like it's laid out for you in that way um but also just how like for both of them where i was like i feel like i'm reading about the landscape of comedy that i've grown up in oh for sure like definitely reading bob odenkirk's i mean you know like he's referencing that whole alternative comedy scene like in the late Mm -hmm. 90s early aughts and i moved here like at the end of 2001 kind of like at the height of that entire bust bust boom sorry boom yeah yeah sorry boom of of alt comedy around la and uh yeah i loved like hearing about all about that i feel like um I don't know if this is really annoying for my partner who you also met out on the picket lines, but like he'll come home from work and I'm like, let me tell you a story. And it's not a story that happened to me. It's a story I like heard on a podcast that day or sure, heard sure. In, like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so I feel like I did that with with um, Bob's book so much where I was like, oh, my God. And then 
uh, when we get to meet, like as if it's like characters and not real people. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But it was delightful. Um, Okay, I was really excited that you listed this one because I am a new fan of Sarah Schaefer's and I want to know everything (gasps) about her book. Yes. Okay, for those of you listening who are unfamiliar with the comedian, Sarah Schaefer. She is a stand-up comic, but she's more than that. She's also very artistic. And she, you might have seen some of her viral videos online where she creates miniatures and she does like stories along with the miniatures. They're absolutely like mesmerizing and she's super talented at making them. And I had always been a fan of her standup. I had first been exposed to her standup in 2017. And because she is um, um, a Writers Guild uh, picket captain at Warner Brothers, where we go all yeah. the time. I always see Sarah <laughs> there, and I was picketing with her one day, and we were talking just about whatever. And then she mentioned that she had a memoir, and I was like, Sarah, hold the phone. I didn't know you had a memoir. And she's like, Oh, yes, it's called Grand. And it's kind of about grief, but it's also about this adventure that she takes with her sister, like uh, ra- uh, rafting, boating, whatever, through the Grand Canyon, oh. which is like an intense trip where she was like telling me about it. Basically, like you're totally cut off from anywhere. Like you can't like text someone from the bottom of the Grand Canyon or whatever yeah. for like nine days or whatever. And everything you take in, you take out. Okay. Mm. Including Mm -hmm. like, you know, like waste. Yeah. Your body. Yeah. Yeah. Going to the bathroom. So like, this is like this whole thing. And you're like with these strangers doing this thing. And I was like, I have to read this. Um, And you had mentioned the adventure memoir wild, which I also loved. And I was like, this sort of, to me, like is an overlap of wild. Only Sarah is so comedic. It's a little bit I mean, there is the grief there too of, um, cause she's talking about losing, um, her mom and yeah. she's been very open about that in her stand up, which I think makes her so like endearing and vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Um, but she's a great writer and I just uh. really loved it. I, it's called grand and, um, I was so excited to learn that she had this memoir and I like wrote, read it a couple weeks later and I was like, Sarah, this is so good. (laughs) Yeah. So I think that you will really enjoy reading it. I cannot wait. I have only seen Sarah perform one time. I saw her on a Margaret Cho and friends at Largo. Okay. And my friend that I was there with at the show was like elbowing me during Sarah's set and was like, do you know her? And I was like, no, but I love crafting. And so the way that this, oh. that she was using her miniatures, like she was bringing them out of her little fanny yeah. pack on stage and telling these stories and like weaving it through with her art. I was like, I'm so fascinated. It's brilliant. So I, it's brilliant. It is. And it's like, I mean, I say this a lot. This is a feminist show. So let's be feminist about it. Okay. Like, <laughs> I said this about um, Greta Gerwig in the lead up to Barbie, Uh where I was like, if this were, and I love Ryan Johnson, but like if this were Ryan Johnson and doing all these interviews, talking about how much he knows about film history, everyone on the internet would be like, this is the scholar of our day. Like this is the most impressive, like student of film who has become this like genius filmmaker. Yeah. Yeah. But Greta Gerwig was talking about romances and farces and musicals and like traditionally feminized stuff. And I felt that way when I saw Sarah on stage where I was like, this is a kind of creativity and like. Oh, this person would have like 27 like Netflix if it was a man. Like 20. Is that that sort of what you're like getting at? Is like, if it were like a dude, we would be like, oh, we must prop him up. Yeah. And that there was just, like, something about, like, creativity and, and, like, women's art that's kind of seen as, like, oh, that's cute. That's cute that right. you did like, that. Right, like, it's not serious or something, but it is right. But it is so skilled. I mean, it's so niche and skilled. Right. 
like for generations, it's like, oh, women didn't do math. It's like, oh, all the quilting that they were doing and all the like math that was involved <laughs> in like running a household. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I bought, I did buy from like Sarah's Etsy, a little like miniature crime scene bu- uh, bulletin board. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Loved it. So I, she's someone, if I, if I meet her on the picket, I'll have to go introduce myself because. Oh, 100%. I'm, she's overseas right now. Um, cause she was performing oh, at yeah. Edinburgh and stuff. So, but when she's back in LA, we're, we obviously need to mob her. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I I was very pleased I got to have a moment. And this is not a memoir, but I I see um the comedian Lori Kilmartin out there a lot. Oh yeah, Lori Kilmartin is so funny. I follow her online too and stuff. Yeah. So funny. She'd been a Conan writer for ages and she wrote a book called Dead People Suck. And it's a book that I read after my dad died. Oh wow. <laughs> and so just the fact that I was able to like literally crossing the street say like, hey, dead people suck. Yeah. <laughs> she was like, oh, cool. She, my book. She like, was so open about her mom dying of, of COVID. Yeah. At the yeah. Like, like in 2020. That was so painful. And she like tweeted through it and she did. And I was totally there for it. I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was like an honest, a needed honesty. Agreed. Um, yeah. So just to like. We, uh, we we seamlessly moved into adventure with with Sarah's book yeah. and Cheryl Strayed's book Wild, which is like super successful. A lot of people have read it. I know we're not talking about movies, but I have to say, Nick Hornby's screenplay for Wild is one of my favorite adapted screenplays ever. Amazing! I really loved the film too. Um, when yeah. I read Wild, the beginning of Wild when she describes her grief over her mom, I, I was sobbing. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, I find like sometimes like crying when you're reading a book is such a cathartic thing because you're totally. in silence and like having this private moment. But yeah, it was one of the most powerful explanations, like visceral, I should say, one of the most yes. visceral explanations of loss that I yeah. think I've ever read. Yeah. And it seems like only their most rarefied type of person hikes the Pacific Crest Trail. Yeah, that was a crazy book because she basically was just like, I think she was in such extreme grief that she didn't care if she died. And so she barely yeah. prepared and she was like, fuck it. And then yeah. and then like maybe almost died. And then <laughs> and then a bunch of people were like, you can't tell people to hike with just a pair of shoes and nothing. And it's like, she wasn't, she was just describing like her own. In fact, she, to me, it was like a cautionary tale. (laughs) And that she had the, I don't know what the, the temerity to like journal every day while she was doing it. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) she was on a healing, she was on a mission to, to work through her pain. Yeah. And I would say the same about, this is one that really, Gosh, like, so Chanel Miller's book, mm-hmm. Know My Name, which yeah. uh, if if you don't know her name, uh, she was the victim in the Stanford uh, rape and case Brock- or assault case what, with Brock yeah, Turner. That, yeah. Um, and like. she's She gave a very powerful um, victim statement mm-hmm. that kind of uh, halted people's idea of the system of how we address like sexual assault that yeah. was very f- freaking like profound. And then she wrote, uh, she wrote a memoir about her trauma, about her sexual assault trauma. So if you're interested and, in exploring trauma, mm-hmm. I thought, I thought it was an incredible book. And like the trauma, I mean, again, like I'm really, I'm really conflating everything together, but like, the trauma of then the public trial, like of yes, the re-traumatization of everything that happened once once there was a spotlight, I think is almost even more infuriating. <sighs> it's like once you get past everything that happened, it's like oh, and then she had to defend that she had drinks at a college party, yeah, you know, like that, that sort of stuff. That case was <sighs> so upsetting because 
she was basically discovered by just two random like exchange students or something. Yeah. And they, I mean, they're kind of like these bystanders of this whole thing or whatever. Yeah. But I mean, thank goodness there are still people out there in the world that, you know, kind of reach out. Yeah. And it's like, I put that in like adventure, but it's also like a story of grief. It's also a coming of age story. Like she was an adult, but she was. She was a very young adult. She was a very young young adult. adult. Like she was like, she was college age, right? Like 22 or something. Yeah. Yeah, Or just, Yeah. yeah. And she's also a talented illustrator. So I really recommend like following her on Instagram. I saw, for example, that like she got a collab, like a, a deal to collab with a athletic shoe company and like put her artistic designs on them. And I was like, cool. these are the people that should be getting collabs. Oh, 100%. Like, yeah. like she's brave as shit. Like she came out totally. and like, oh, I'm allowed to say that on your podcast. Of course. Like, heck. <laughs> she's brave as heck. <laughs> um yeah that was a pain that was a tough read though yeah okay so this one i haven't read everyone's told me to read it which is the jeanette (gasps) mccurdy book okay now we get into the grief let's wrap it up on grief this is grief this is trauma this is celebrity this is like everything Mm. that book i'm glad my mom died was I had never heard of Jeanette McCurdy because I'm a little old to have mm-hmm. known her. Like Nickelodeon yeah, shows. That's right? right. Yeah. Yeah. So I was not, I wasn't raised on her sort of um, TV uh, celebrity, you know? Yeah. Um, however, the book, I mean, how can you, how can you look away from a title? I'm glad my mom died. And then yeah. she's on the cover of the book, like smiling with an urn. And it's like very. It looks like a Sweet Valley High book cover. It's such it's such an interesting package of mm-hmm. a book that drew me in. And then I heard other people saying that was they were very um, like excited to read it. Like they were anticipating this book. And I mm-hmm. was like, OK, I'm going to read it, even though I don't know her story at all. and. Man, what an amazing writer she is. Oh, cool. She is an incredible documentarian of her own inner life. Mm. And it is very um, immediate. Like you feel like you are living her journey along with her as she's experiencing it. And talk about like uh, tension. Between yeah. grief and liberation. Relief. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people who have had complicated moms, mm-hmm. um, I don't have a complicated mom, but I know a lot of people, my mom had a complicated mom. Yeah, yeah, My yeah, mom yeah. actually had a, like, I kind of want my mom to read this book. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, it it's, you just... I can't imagine that kind of anguish. Yeah. But she found how her you, way through, you know? How do you gift your mom a book called I'm Glad I told my died. mom about it. <laughs> I said, I said, Mom, I read this book. I'm glad my mom died. And she's like, what? <laughs> um, okay. She, that doesn't, she doesn't read memoir. Notes. She doesn't read memoir as much as I do. <laughs> so. I really loved. It was a hit. Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zahner. <gasps> yes, I heard that was amazing. That's on one. That's on my list. I you really, loved it, really, and it was. Really is it, it has a humorous um, tone, or or is it? No. Okay, because <laughs> the title <laughs> no. to me sounds like a dark comedic. You know, what's interesting is that Michelle Zahner is the lead singer of the indie rock band Japanese Breakfast, so she is like. She's a like, cool, like she's in the world and she's like, okay, you know, she's been doing shows and gigs and like doing all of that sort of thing. So there's an element where you're, and I actually didn't realize that when I started reading the book, I'd heard of the band, but it didn't, I didn't connect the name okay. of who she was. And it's called Crying in H Mart. H Mart's a Korean grocery store chain. And she talks about, she had a complicated relationship with her mom 
But when her mom dies of cancer, she has now lost her connection to being Korean. Okay. She's half Korean on her mom's side. So she goes to H Mart grocery stores and is like, oh, this That's how she connects my, to her mom. Yeah, like I can learn to cook the things that she cooked and I can understand the packaging because she taught me that. And am I allowed to be Korean anymore because my link to Korea is gone? Okay. Like, how does that work? But you're kind of reading it and you're like, oh, this is just like a girl who's learning how to play guitar and she's gigging and she wants to get tattoos and a nose ring and her strict mother doesn't want her to do any of that. And then you start to realize like, all of this, it's just all so interconnected where like her rebellion is what made her successful and right. her her like racial identity is just really tied up with her grief in a way that I found just super, super interesting because I think no matter what, like there's a reason why we try to connect with our ancestors or like our, our grandma or whatever and right. say like, oh, but she used to cook this or she used to say this this word in this language and what does that mean and she just spells it out in a way that's like it's not like a devastating read you know it's not one of those where you're like oh god but it is like it is particularly also a really great depiction of like long illness and cancer okay. so that is the thing that like you know there's a lot of um there's a lot of different grief experiences, but I think the one where you have months or years of grief. That anticipatory, yeah. Yeah, like that was very uh, helpful to read her writing Yeah, that's it. a singular experience that a lot mm -hmm. of people need sort of support around. Yeah. For sure. I'm going to just like, put that on my list. That and Mel Brooks. yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I'll do one different. to feel sad and one to feel a little. <laughs> <laughs> and the the last one, it's also one where there's illness, and the title is just what gets me: is spoiler alert, the hero dies. Okay. Did you read that no. one? No. Tell me everything. It is. Should I read it? It's Michael Oziello, the like TV reviewer extraordinaire, who is writing about meeting his husband and going through his husband's illness Aww. with him. Okay. And they did make a very beautiful adaptation of it with Jim Parsons as playing Michael Oziello. Oh, I love um, Jim Parsons. I think he's so talented. He's so good in this movie as like... And it's called The Hero Dies as well? Like it's the same... The movie they just called Spoiler Alert. Spoiler Alert, include... okay. They didn't include the hero dies, but I think in like the trailer, he says like, this is, this is the man like I fell in love with and he dies by the end of this. I like, love that title as someone who is into television. Spoiler alert. Totally. Yeah, that's really clever. And it's like, it's definitely one that like made me cry so Aww. hard. Like, yeah, I can't imagine like the experience of like dressing your husband for transfer yeah you know that sort of thing where you're just like oh my god like it's one thing if it's a parent a grandparent but like your partner you know that's a whole different thing um but it's so rich with pop culture and like tv and there's like fun in it and, f and a lot of humor in it because he really like highlights the absurd so like even when you're dealing with like chemo and stuff like that yeah how absurd some of those experiences can be, um, he tells in just a really like fun way. And you're like, oh my God, that's so funny. Oh God, his poor husband. <laughs> like, but it's such an angle to it's such an angle in for surviving something that horrific. Totally. Totally. You know? Um well, I don't yeah. know I don't know that one at all. In fact, I'm just uh some of the other ones you mentioned I'd heard of, but that one I hadn't. So that's yeah. That one I'm definitely going to you know, brace myself to read and experience. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but worth it. it. Worth it for for TV lovers. Like there's almost too much TV in it if you weren't Not a for TV me. person. <laughs> Not for exactly. me. Exactly. I was like, tell me more. Tell me more about like Gilmore Girls. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's get into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, this is our sampling, but we'll be right back after a break to share some freakouts. What's your freak out? 
Now it's time to talk about what's been thrilling us, moving us, upsetting us, or infuriating us this past week. Janie, what's your freak out? Um, I am not a huge reality show consumer. However, I, like the rest of America, had seen a bunch of people online this this year kind of freak out about something that happened on that show called Vanderpump Rules. Mm. And boy, did I feel out of the loop because I did not <laughs> understand what they were freaking out about, who these people were. And I, and I had thought, do I want to um, know what this is? And so I, I, um, I mentioned it to my husband. I was like, should we watch the show um, just to know what it is? And he's like, no, no, no. And then we were at a party and like some people were talking about it. And we we're like, okay, we don't know what is going on with this stuff, yeah. but should we watch it? And they were like, yeah, watch it. And they were like friends that we trusted. And we're like, okay, I guess we're going to start from season one. And it's a 10 season show. That's always the thing is like stuff like Love Island or whatever. I'm like, I can't start now. Like it's it's been on much. for too many years. So we went back to season one and we started it and we're sort of like in the middle of it and we're avoiding Googling anything. Um, but it is a super outrageous show. Like the people are outrageous. They are just like, and also here's, I think the thing that keeps me sort of hooked is I really want to know what is real and what is produced. Yeah. yeah. And I like, that's the memoir part of it. Like someone needs to write right. a memoir of like, I was the head producer on Vanderpump Rules and this is yeah. how we, this is how we manufactured this moment or, or this one moment wasn't manufactured. That's just how crazy these people are or something like that. You know what I mean? Like I want the real authentic story of it one day. So I guess that's yeah. sort of my freak out stuff, but I don't know. Wow. What a, what a, so did you watch 10 seasons of this in the last like two months? Not 10. We're only like in the middle, like on season four. So we, we, yeah. we, we've been sort of making our way through. So we still have a ways to go and we cannot Google anything as our, Ugh. as our promise to ourselves, um, to know what the big hubbub was that oh er erupted God. this this past year so i mean my favorite uh element of any of this having not watched the show is that lisa vanderpump's restaurant sir stands for sexy unique restaurant i mean i didn't know who she was i didn't know about sir i i like i've learned it all from watching from season one that the, she has yeah. a restaurant in west hollywood called sexy unique restaurant no one had ever mentioned so this place funny. to me I've never been there. <laughs> I, I knew nothing. And I was like, wait, this is like, this is a restaurant that's operating, that's like still operating yeah. that we could like go to if we felt like it. One of my favorite places in the city to write is the West Hollywood Public Library. Oh, that uh, is a nice library. Is, is that the one that's across the street from the Pacific Design Center? Yes. And you get to yes. park for free there. Yes. Yes, I have been yes. to that nice library before. Yes. It's got a lot of beautiful art in it. You can sit and look out at the Pacific Design Center for a couple of hours and and work or whatever. Uh, and in their parking lot is a car, like a Sir branded car <laughs> that I think just like owns a parking spot down there. Oh my and God, I probably go, like parked there and seen <laughs> it and just so didn't funny. know what it was. But that yeah. car, is it pink? Yes. Because that <laughs> car is in the show. Yeah. Oh my, like, what purpose does it serve? They wrote it. Serve. <laughs> the serve. <laughs> they wrote it um, through West Hollywood uh, during the Pride Parades. Oh. And they cool. all, like, wear, like, bikinis and oil their bodies up <laughs> and, like, hang off of it and kind of ride it around and... You know, like Lisa Vanderpump is like the pageant queen, and you know, oh <laughs> on God. the yeah. So it's sort of like an um, an it serves an advertisement purposes. Oh, well, I've been I've been influenced. I'll say that. Yeah. Have you? So have um, you ever eaten that, sir? Or been inside? I of, have. What? <laughs> yeah. But and you don't even watch where, the show. No, but it's like somebody from out of town will be here and say, "Can we go to Sir?" No way. And I'm like. 
<laughs> oh, if you want, you know, and I go and I'm like, this is a pretty bad cocktail for $18, but like, sure. <laughs> what is the, and they're like, look over there. It's so-and-so, you know, was the that food sort of good? They frequently reference the fried goat cheese balls, which seems very mm. basic to me. Like, isn't that just like a mozzarella stick only in goat cheese? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it seemed like, like if you go to Vegas, but yeah, you're not yeah. going to like a really good restaurant. That's what you're eating at, sir. Okay. Well, I mean, I might have to go there once I finish all of the seasons just to see what it's like. <laughs> yeah. And uh, did you see Lisa Vanderpump? Um, She's very recognizable. She's very recognizable. She's very like... I don't think I've seen glam- her. There'd probably be a, a crowd around her. She's sort of grand dame in her essence. She's... I've seen her pop up on like Trixie Motel, which was a... Uh, Trixie Mattel drag queen showed Lisa Vanderpump was the special guest. Okay. I think that was my exposure to her. Okay. But, um, well, my freak out this week is a new podcast uh, called Handsome. What's it called? It, I'm sorry. Handsome. Handsome. Like, like, like a handsome man. Yes. Okay. It's a dapper, good looking. And it is three comedians I love. Fortune Feimster, Tig Notaro, and Mae Martin. Okay. And the first episode I listened to, I was like, oh, you never know. Like a new comedy podcast could be anything, right? It could be about, it could be about comedy. It could be a call-in show. It could be sketch or improv. You never know. Uh, They get a voicemail from Sarah Silverman asking very earnestly, how do you clean your butthole? (laughs) And the entire episode is these three comics giggling like little girls (laughs) answering the question, (laughs) like talking about it ends up like they're talking about hygiene and then they're talking about dating and sex and they're talking about like gender stuff a little bit like it gets just it was just them being silly. And that was just what I wanted. So this podcast, is it is it an ongoing podcast or is it just a one off? Uh, ongoing, but this was just the first episode. It just started. So does every episode answer that question, like with different people? Or That would be amazing <laughs> if that was the concept of a podcast. <laughs> and this every week, week, a new person. We ask Lisa Vanderpump <laughs> how she cleans her butthole. <laughs> we got Kamala Harris next week. I mean, nah. <laughs> oh my God, that would be so Or it's just so sort good. of no, like... It's- yeah. I think it's it's the three of them, and then I think a famous friend will pose a question. <laughs> and so it happened to be Sarah Silverman, so that's where she oh, goes. Because she's a provocateur. Like, her comedy is provocateur. Like, it's always yes. a little bit, yeah, like shock. Yeah. Shock jock. Yeah. Right. So I don't know if, like, Margaret Cho were to call in with a question, <laughs> if it would, would be more not about be. something else. Yeah. You know? I don't know. Okay. Um. Yeah, and it was just funny to hear. Just it was like, light people. and really like it was light and and yeah. euphoric, sort of. T- totally, totally. Like there was, uh, I just appreciated it so much. Like I feel like even though I do listen to a lot of comedy podcasts, like just to be giggling for like half an hour <sighs> was just what a nice thing. Oh, absolutely. To have. I think scientifically <laughs> they've proven such a thing. Yeah, <laughs> and we all need it right now. <laughs> Gosh, we sure do. We must preserve that. <laughs> yes, protect it at all costs. Protect it at all costs. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, that sounds good. I'll have to check that one out. <laughs> Please do. And the good thing is there's just one episode out now, so you can listen to it, and then it's not like you have a backlog. Oh, that's a good up. point. It's not like Vanderpump. It's not homework. <laughs> it's not like right. this daunting uh, task I've, uh, done to myself. <laughs> right. Just like all of our listeners now are going to go read 10 to 12 memoirs. Tomes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think it, well, do your listeners interact? Like, do your listeners write in? I, I, I would love to hear like people's, um, what favorite memoirs and, and stuff because. Totally. Like that's what I'm hoping for is I feel like so much of this podcast is me just being like, well, this is what I wanted to watch. Are you watching it? And so I want people to like, let us know on social, let us know on Patreon and Discord. What are, what are your favorite memoirs? Or like, if there's anything we missed, like, I feel like there's, that's the great thing about 
memoirs as you might say like oh but if you loved wild you've got to read this one absolutely so I feel like absolutely that's yes that's what i'm hoping for from people yeah um, and like ones that like you can't stop thinking about i love to know what other people's ones are like i can't stop thinking about it yeah i mean i have a whole list of ones that uh that i've either started or that friends have recommended but i i was like well i can't weigh in on this yet because i haven't read it at all That has been our show for today. Thank you. Jamie, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Kat, that was such so fun. I love talking about memoirs and it was such a delight talking to you in particular um, outside of the picket line. <laughs> Where can people please subscribe to my weekend water substack? It's weekendwater.substack.com. And um, then you can find out what all I'm up to because all my updates are there. <laughs> awesome. I have been Kat Spada. You can find me at cat underscore EX underscore Machina on Twitter and stuff. And save the date. Uh, Sunday, October 1st at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We are going to do an AMA about what's next for Feminist Frequency Radio. Uh, so I want to start putting that out there for people to pay attention to. Find out more uh, on social at FemFreak. And if you are a Patreon subscriber get into that discord we've got a discord that's active we've got listeners who are talking about life the universe and everything so check it out that's where we'll be holding the ama so more details on that soon um and if you are a patreon subscriber stick around for the bonus where Janie and i are going to talk about the gina davis institute and more cool feminist media stuff so please help other people find the show subscribe rate comment on your favorite podcast app thanks so much for listening Bye.